Hello, I'm Dr. Lori Glaze, Director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, and I'm here to talk with you today about NASA's Planetary Science Program. Within the Planetary Science Program, we address those high-level questions with a variety of missions that span the solar system all the way from Mercury uh, with the BepiColombo mission, which is actually an ESA and JAXA mission, the European Space Agency and Japanese Space Agency mission, with NASA contributions where we work with them. Uh, so all the way from Mercury, all the way out to the New Horizons mission in the top left corner, which is currently exploring the Kuiper Belt out beyond Pluto. Um, we have on this chart 29 different missions, and if you look at the text next to each spacecraft, if the text is in yellow or orange, that means that that spacecraft is in development. We're building it. It has not yet launched. And if the text is in green or blue, that means that the spacecraft has launched and it's, it's currently in operations um, somewhere out in space. Next to the uh, spacecraft names, in some cases, you will see in brackets, for example, BepiColombo again near Mercury um, says ESA. That means it's led by the European Space Agency with NASA partnership. Um, another example would be the JUICE mission um, out by Jupiter, uh, which also is a European Space Agency-led mission with NASA participation. I'm going to spend some time talking about some of the exciting things that are going on in NASA science right now, NASA planetary science. One of the most exciting things uh, going on right now, uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission uh, is a mission to study an asteroid um, called Bennu. Uh, the size of this asteroid um, is about the size of the Empire State Building in, in New York City. It's a little larger than that. Um, and it's a specific type of asteroid. Um, it's a carbonaceous asteroid, which means that it's a very rocky asteroid that's <clears throat> rich in carbon. Um, and so we believe that these types of carbonaceous asteroids are early remnants of the, the beginnings of our solar system. So we expect these uh, materials that are present on Bennu to be on the order of four and a half billion years old. And so they will help us to understand uh, what types of materials were the building blocks of all of the planets in the solar system. And this particular asteroid was chosen for a variety of important reasons, one of which is we're looking for the uh, those building blocks, the water molecules, hopefully, and uh, organic molecules that were potentially de delivered to Earth by such asteroids and could have been the seeds for life on Earth. But also, Bino is particularly important because it is a near-Earth asteroid, which means it passes, every now and then, it passes near Earth's orbit. Um, it's in a highly elliptical orbit that brings it close to Earth periodically, and it is potentially hazardous to Earth. Uh, there is a chance, a 1 in 2,700 chance, that Bennu might actually impact Earth at the end of the 22nd century, between 2175 and 2199. So it's a very high interest to us to understand its orbit and when and how it, it could potentially um, impact Earth in the future. The key objectives of this mission, first and foremost, is to return and analyze a sample from the surface of Bennu. Uh, the spacecraft has been uh, in orbit around Bennu for over a year and a half now, mapping out the surface. And these beautiful high-resolution images you see on the left um, show just how uh, what, a, what an amazing place this is. It actually was very, very surprising when we arrived. We expected to see much more fine-grained material on the surface. But what we found is an asteroid that's just covered in large blocks which meant that collecting a sample was going to be particularly challenging. But the team has worked extremely hard uh, to develop uh, new techniques, new navigation capabilities that allowed them to precision target the surface of Bennu in order to collect a sample. The sampling site they chose is shown on the right. It's called Nightingale Crater, and you can see the size of the spacecraft for scale. Uh, relative to the size of this crater. It's actually a much smaller area than the team had originally planned for and, and much smaller than the spacecraft was designed for for taking the sample. But as I said, they collected uh, or they developed new techniques that allow the spacecraft to precision target um, at, at a precise point within that uh, Nightingale crater. 
So this is just some of the uh, incredible images that we have of the sampling event, which happened on October 20th. Uh, what's incredible about this is that the asteroid is 200 million miles away from Earth. The light time delay is over 18 minutes for the signal to, uh, to transfer from the spacecraft back to Earth. And yet we were able to navigate the spacecraft down to a location that was less than a meter from the target point. On the left-hand side, you can see Nightingale Crater. Um, and what you can see in the green are the areas that we uh, believed were safe for the uh, spacecraft to touch the surface. We did not land, we just touched the surface and then backed away. The red areas are the places where we thought there were uh, significant hazards to the spacecraft. And had the spacecraft uh, detected one of those hazards during its descent, it would have backed away. But as I said, uh, it almost hit exactly on the spot that we had identified. And you can see on the right images of that actual tag event. And what we found was that the tag head, the sampling head, which is probably about 30 centimeters, maybe 35 centimeters across, um, as it nears the surface, it's at the end of a five meter boom. Um, it actually touched the surface and even penetrated into the surface just a little bit, several centimeters into the regolith, into the soil on the surface of the asteroid. Um, and then we fired a nitrogen cylinder, which actually acted like a reverse vacuum cleaner that pushed out the, the particles and pushed them and directed them into the sampling container around the edge of that uh, sampling head. We uh, had a minimum requirement to collect 60 grams of material from the surface. And what we found out as we uh, pulled away from the asteroid, these are images of the sampling head taken two days after the sampling attempt. Uh, what we found was that we believe that the sampling head is so full of material uh, that actually some of it was leaking out. Um, and you can see here in a series of three images that are playing uh, around in a circle, um, you can see particles that are moving away from the sampling head. Uh, we had just moved the head, and of course that acceleration on the head disturbed the material, and they uh, were fluidized and started to escape out of the, the sampling head. There is in fact a flap, a mylar flap inside that is intended to hold those, those particles inside the sampling head, but if you can see, over on the left-hand side of the interior of the sampling head, there's a kind of a, a black bulge there. Um, and in this uh, stretch, you can't see it, but there's actually several rocks over there that are holding that mylar flap open. So we believe we've got so much material in the head that it's just overflowing. Um, and so because of that, uh, we believe we have more than enough sample. We're, we're hoping we have as much as a, a kilogram or maybe as much as two kilograms of material in the head. Uh, we made a decision to go ahead and stow the head and, and begin our preparations to return to Earth. We have images of the sampling head uh, is stowed inside the sample return capsule, and that's the lid of the sample return capsule being closed. Um, saying we've got our sample, it's all protected inside that return capsule, and we're ready to begin thinking about coming home. We have to wait a little while until spring, until Bennu is in the right alignment with Earth, so that when, uh, when the spacecraft uh, returns to Earth's orbit, that Earth is actually there in the right place. Uh, so it will begin its trip, trip back in the spring, and will arrive back at Earth in September of 2023. I'm going to change topics. The other really exciting thing that just happened for NASA just recently, in July, on July 30th, we launched the Perseverance rover to Mars. This is our next rover mission to Mars. It is an astrobiology mission to study not only the geology of Mars, but also to look for the potential of ancient life that may have, if it occurred, may have been preserved on the surface of Mars. Uh, we passed uh, the halfway mark, uh, where Perseverance is now a little over halfway on its way to Mars. And on February 18th, the Perseverance rover will land on the surface of Mars. I would like to talk about some of the really cool things that we have coming up uh, in the future. 
Uh, when I was talking about Bennu, I mentioned that it was a near-Earth asteroid and that it was a potentially hazardous asteroid. And so one of the things that's an important part of planetary science at NASA is something we call planetary defense, which is where we try to identify and characterize potential um, hazardous asteroids and then develop techniques that might let us mitigate uh, any types of future uh, future damage that could be done by an, by an asteroid. So this here is a mission that we're going to launch next summer in July called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Um, this is a mission that will fly to the Didymos uh, asteroid. Um, and Didymos has a small moon called Dimorphos. Um, what you'll see in this video is that the orbit of Dimorphos is going around um, Didymos in its original orbit right now. And what we need to do in order to protect ourselves from a potentially hazardous asteroid is we don't necessarily need to move the asteroid, we just need to change its orbit enough such that it slows down or speeds up. So you can see the DART spacecraft as it approaches the Dimorphos uh, moon, it impacts into that moon. There's a small CubeSat that's contributed by the Italian Space Agency that's taking images. And as we hit that small moon, we slow it down just enough to change its orbit such that it's now in a smaller, shorter orbit around the parent uh, asteroid Didymos. And so we expect to test this uh, technique um, in 2022 when the uh, DART spacecraft uh, uh, encounters Didymos. And we'll be able to uh, characterize just how well uh, we can transfer momentum from the spacecraft to the moon and, uh, and change its orbit, which would help us to uh, better understand how we might protect ourselves um, in the future. The next big mission after DART that we're working on right now and getting ready to launch is a mission called Lucy. Um, and Lucy is a mission that will launch um, in October of 2021, so just under a year from now. And Lucy is named after the skeleton that was found in, in Africa uh, that we believe or that scientists believe is one of the earliest ancestors of all humankind. And so the idea behind Lucy is to explore some of the most primitive asteroids in our solar system that can help us understand the, the very history of how our solar system formed. Um, these are a, a special class of asteroids called Trojan asteroids. And if you look on the top right, you can see uh, an, an animation there with an orange dot, which is Jupiter. And the orange circle is actually the orbit of Jupiter around the sun. And the green dots on either side leading and trailing Jupiter, those are the Trojan asteroids that are trapped in Jupiter's orbit um, through a balancing of, uh, of gravitational pull from both Jupiter and the sun at special places called Lagrange points. They are stable uh, locations, stable orbit locations, so they're trapped in those orbits. And these asteroids, we believe, are remnants from the earliest part of the solar system. And as the giant planets have migrated within the solar system, uh, these uh, asteroids have recorded that history. So Lucy will fly by uh, seven of these asteroids over 12 years. Um, with the first flyby in August of 2027. And they will look at and characterize the diversity of the different asteroids that are there, understand the surface geology, what do we see on the surfaces of these asteroids, look at their color and composition, um, try and understand the interiors and bulk properties by the, we can, as the spacecraft flies by, that gravitational pull gives us information on the interior properties and help us also better understand if there are satellites or rings or other things associated with each of these asteroids. So a very cool mission that we're looking forward to launching um, next fall. Those are just a few of the things we're looking forward to in the coming year. But you can find more information about all of NASA's planetary science missions at solarsystem.nasa.gov. Thank you.